Well, it's a pleasure to share this morning and, and bring the Word to God. I know that one of my friends here struggles with PowerPoint, and I apologize that I've got a PowerPoint presentation, so today's the, the gospel according to PowerPoint today. But I'm also old school, and I was always taught old school, when you come and preach the Word, find the biggest Bible you can and take it with you. So I'm kind of balancing things out here. <laughs> so I've got a lot of slides in this PowerPoint. Can you see the thumb? We're not moving yet. We're not moving yet. Go back, go back. <laughs> so what I'm speaking about today, and I was really delighted to be asked to speak about this, is evangelism through social justice. Love it. Love it. Two things I'm really um, invested in, evangelism and social justice. Now, evangelism, I am fascinated by evangelism. I have been since I came to faith when I was 15, and there are three classifications of evangelism, I think, and we have a wide spectrum of, of how well we do evangelism in the church universal. So category number one is the most common one you would think about evangelism. You see the picture of Billy Graham there. There is the evangelism of the Word, the preaching, the teaching, the testimony, the written Word, academia, apologetics, all that kind of evangelism through the Word. Billy Graham's a great example. There's a lot of Christians who say, I won't evangelize because I'm not Billy Graham. You don't have to be Billy Graham. I have a friend from Wigan called Alan. Alan's a science teacher. That's what he does for a living. But Alan has had the privilege of going to over 100 countries to share the gospel. He's seen tens of thousands of people come to faith and thousands of people healed. Only because God turns up. God is an omnipresent anytime, anywhere, able to do abundantly more than we can ask or think God. You don't have to be Billy Graham to help bring someone to faith. Second form of evangelism is evangelism by action. You know, the feeding the poor, uh, fighting out against corruption, meeting the needs of people in society, showing the love to them in a practical way. And we've got Francis of Assisi up here who famously said, wherever you go, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and if necessary, use words. So there's evangelism by action. And then lastly, there is evangelism by lifestyle. You have to live in a way that is consistent with the word that you preach, or the word that you confess, or the word that you believe. Or as one of my friends, non-Christian, told me and put it to me when I was a teenager, you can't talk about the good news Bible and have a bad news face. <laughs> so what is the message that we as Christians, as a church, as the church universal, what is the message that we are communicating with the world? It's a big, a really important question. You can go into theology, talk about doctrine. Is that the message? Is it the testimony? Is it the practical reaching out? What is the message that we should be going to the world with? I have a, a challenge for you. I want you to think about this after today. Could you sum up in one sentence what you think the good news is? Could you sum up in one sentence what the good news is? For me, that sentence is, not only has God made it possible for me to get into heaven, God has also made it possible for heaven to get into me. That for me is the good news. It's not an eternal destination, it's an eternal life that starts now, as soon as you receive Jesus and that kingdom flows through you. But it is a confused message that we put out here, so I'm gonna just show you some church signs from America, uh, the messages that this church has said with our best effort, here's the one sentence that we're gonna to give to the people of our community. Let's go. We love hurting people. We do love people who are hurting. <laughs> but sadly, for some non-Christians, they, they see the stories in the newspapers where Christians have actually hurt people. And that's a message that they see. Don't let worries kill you, let the church help. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
do you know what hell is? Come and hear our preacher. <laughs> now, in America, that's because they think you really need to understand what hell is, because if you know what hell is, you'll have the freedom of God in you, and you will come to God. And so, if you don't know what hell is, come and hear our preacher. But for people who don't know that language, our preacher's hellish. <laughs> We have tr do you have trouble sleeping? We have sermons. Come and hear one. <laughs> Again, perhaps, perhaps their thinking was, you know, your worries are keeping you up at night. You know, we'll bring the peace of God into you so you can sleep. But also the world sees this and says, Christianity is born. It will put you to sleep. It's the last thing I want to do. If you don't love God, go to hell. I've had numerous conversations with people who say, you Christian guys love telling us that we're going to hell. You protest at things that we enjoy, and you turn up with your placards and say, you're going to hell. Now, there's part of that, obviously, is the part of the message, but it can't be the forefront and the focal point of the message. How unloving is that? Although we can argue it's loving to tell people that, anyway. Next one. Life stinks. We have a pew for you. <laughs> but some people think the church is this building with uncomfortable seats and a fusty old building at that, and it stinks. To a dyslexic atheist, there is a dog. I really struggle with this one. I am I'm disgusted by this, that a church would make fun of someone's lack of ability to read, a medical condition, and they're putting out there is, let's, let's laugh at this. I think it's wrong. What kind of message is that? Honk if you love Jesus, text while driving if you want to meet him. <laughs> That's the whole thing, you know, drive past the sign if you like it, peep the horn, beep, 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 yay, we love Jesus. But, you know, text for driving. Safety message, brilliant. That's, that's the gospel's a safety message. Next one. Choose the bread of life or you are toast. <laughs> now, funny for us as Christians, like, oh, that's, that's, that's kind of quirky, that's cool, that's kind of cute. But what message is that to someone who doesn't know our language? Has the church opened a bakery? Is that their new brand of bread, the bread of life? Will they get a free sample? I don't know. Next one. If you don't like the way you were born, try being born again. I, I kind of like that. It is. Let's be born again. Let's, let's accept the, the, the message of Jesus, John's gospel. However, if you don't know the language, what does it mean? Does it mean that if my life's so bad, I should, I should end my life and be reincarnated? If you don't know the language, what's the message? We as a church, we have to find the right language and communicate with people in their own language in a relevant, meaningful way and bring the relevance of the amazing good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, let's, let's turn to the big Bible. Let's, let's hear the word of God uh, together again. And it's Luke chapter 4, and at verse 16, talking about Jesus. He went to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I love that statement from Jesus. He's anointed to bring good news to the poor. And Jesus was poor. He was born into poverty, into a poor family. He was born in a borrowed room. He became a refugee. And he grew up working with his hands. 
He knew what it was like to be poor. And he knew the good news he was about to bring, the proclamation of the year of God's favor, where the blind would see, the oppressed would be set free. The good news, absolutely fantastic. But if we read on in Luke's gospel in chapter four, by the end of that passage, in his hometown, talking to the most religious people there, the most godly people there, Jesus was rejected. They rejected him, rejected his message, and they tried to kill him by throwing him off a cliff. Now, I'm not gonna leap to conclusions here, but I think they didn't like what he said. But God is an omnipresent, anytime, anywhere God who is able to do abundantly more than we can ask or think. And the thing was, those people that day that heard Jesus, God turned up in their synagogue and made a declaration. And they said, no, this doesn't fit with our theology. Don't want to hear it. It's not right. It's wrong. You're wrong. And they got all messed up and tried to kill him. The point I want to make from that is we have to be ready when God turns up. When he turns up with his agenda, it might not be our agenda. And sometimes he bursts our theology. We think we've got God all worked out, but he bursts his theology, our theology. How can I say that? Well, Paul writes about it in the New Testament and he says that God is able to do abundantly, immeasurably more than we can ask or even think. Our theology is all up here, and God bursts it. I love it when God bursts my theology because he's turned up and he's done something spectacular. So I'd like to share some short testimonies all about social evangelism, social justice, and evangelism. I have to be careful when someone shares testimony. I'm not sharing testimony to bring attention to myself. I'm sharing testimony to bring attention to what I've seen God do. So, let's see. Anybody recognize that building? Shout it out. Where where is it? It is Edinburgh, yes. It is the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Wasn't it always called that? But it's bottom of Lothian Road, Waldorf Astoria. So one day, about 10 years ago, I went to a prayer breakfast in Lothian Road. Further up Lothian Road, a restaurant called Dine brilliant restaurant. The chef there, the guy who owns it, used to be a Michelin star chef. Brilliant. It's right beside the Usher Hall. Fantastic restaurant. Thoroughly recommend it. Uh, this is not the commercial break in the sermon, sorry. <laughs> but I organized this prayer breakfast, and we had there great business leaders from across Edinburgh, partners of law firms, CEOs of companies. We gathered together, had a beautiful breakfast. You know, the beautiful hot rolls, not just any hot roll, it was fantastic hot rolls. And they had these wee yogurt things, I I love my food, yogurt things with the fruit coolies on it, and oh, just wow. And then the prayer time was was awesome. We all came together, about 60 of us, and we prayed for prosperity for the city of Edinburgh, that God would have his way, that the homeless would find a home, that all the needs in the city would be met. Powerful, powerful prayer meeting with good food. Did I mention that I like food? After the meeting, I came out, and I thought, well, I need to get back, get back to my work, which was outside Edinburgh, and I'm going down Lothian Road to um, uh, go back to the train station. And I saw a homeless guy. The Holy Spirit spoke to me to say, go and talk to him. I said, aye, I'm kind of busy. I need to get back to my work. But I can't, I can't have come out of a prayer meeting praying for the homeless and walk past this guy so I thought, here's, here's what I'm going to do. So I went back to the restaurant. I said, see the leftover food? Is it, is it still here? Yep. Can I get two rolls? Oh, you're still hungry? You had plenty. We saw you this morning. You were eating pl- No, it's not for me. It's for somebody else. Get two rolls. In fact, can you put a double portion in each roll? And I'm walking down Lothian Road with these beautiful hot rolls in my hand. And in my head, this is it. I'm going to give the rolls to this guy. He's going to love the rolls. He's munching the rolls. I'll share the gospel with them. Fantastic. God will turn up, amazing things will happen. That's the plan. That was my plan. So what happened was, got up to he's this guy, homeless guy, sitting at the left-hand side of the Waldorf Astoria, outside the kitchen vent, hot air blasting out. It was a cold day, it was January, freezing. 
but this hot air's blasting it. I thought, oh, it's really warm there. So I said, hey, buddy, you want some, some breakfast? Absolutely. Got you some hot rolls here, sausage, bacon, like that. Aye, absolutely. So he starts tucking out the rolls. I sit down beside him on his cardboard, and I share the gospel with him as he's eating the rolls. Doesn't say a word till he's finished his rolls. And then he says, let me tell you, Stephen, because I don't trust myself. Let me tell you, Stephen, that was a great proclamation of the gospel, but I'm a Christian. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> he says, and let me tell you, God is a God of miracles. This is him telling me. I said, how can you, and God meets my every need. I said, how can you say that? You're homeless. And he told me a story about how he was in the army, came out the army, he's got PTSD, he can't live with his loved ones, I'm too hard to live with. I prefer to be out in the street where I can use my army training and I can live, but God miraculously provides for me every day. He said, I got up this morning, it's cold, it's wet, I asked for three things. God, will you give me dry cardboard to sit on? Will you give me a warm place to sit? That was the first two things they said. And, you know, and I was walking down here to get to my favorite spot. Um, I was walking past the back of the hotel, and the guys come out with some cardboard boxes to put in the recycling. I said, I'll take them, thank you very much. Dry cardboard, had they been it all night? Ripped it up, put it down, and my favorite spot is outside the kitchen vent at the Waldorf Astoria, because you get blasted with hot air every day, so God gives me a central heating, gave me a drive seat, and the third thing I asked for is that God would send somebody to bring me a warm breakfast. And he says, not only a warm breakfast, he brought it for one of the best restaurants in town. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Michelin star chef. He says, God is miraculous and miraculously provides me every day. He said, Stephen, can I pray for you? <laughs> I didn't expect that. And I put my hand out and he put both his hands around my hand. And he says, God, I pray. I thank you for everything you've done for me. I pray that you would reveal to Stephen how miraculous you are that you would meet every single need in his life, and that he would know that you are an anytime, anywhere, omnipresent God. And as he prayed, the love of God flowed out this guy. I felt God's grace, his love, his mercy wash over me, and I sat there in Lothian Road, and I wept like a baby as this guy held my hand and prayed for me because I met with God right there, right then. Didn't expect it, but I loved it. So I had in my head, this is how the evangelism thing works. God has different ideas, and I was blessed out of my socks for reaching out to a guy. Next story. So in the passage, Jesus is in his hometown. And in my hometown, I went to speak to the boys' brigade. I grew up in the boys' brigade, but left the boys' brigade when I got married. I had better things on my mind when I got married than going to the boys' brigade. And then went back to the boys' brigade and said, how come in this great big company in Uphall, none of the boys have joined the church? None of the boys have came to faith. And they said, that's because we don't have anybody really to run the Christian faith class, but you could do it, Stephen. Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. So every week I turned up and I'm teaching the guys and I'm sharing testimony. And there was this guy that turned up, and I'm allowed to use his name because he told me. So Ben turned up one day, and Ben, in his own words, is an awkward character, a lot to handle. He's got ADHD, doesn't he fit in. Everywhere he's been in life, he's been rejected, and people, you know, they roll their eyes. I don't know if you've ever seen the, the uh, animated film that's got O in it. What's the name of it, Louise? The, the, the alien guy that comes down, his name's O. Home. Anybody seen Home? Uh, this guy's called O because he's an awkward guy and he turns up and anytime anybody sees him, they go, oh. <laughs> so that's how he got his name, O. Oh. Ben could have been called O. Oh. He's awkward and he doesn't fit in and kind of makes a mess of things when he turns up. That's his own words. But we said, we'll make a home for Ben in the boys' brigade. We'll not give him a row for talking out when he's supposed to be doing the drill and being silent and all this kind of stuff. Shared testimony with him, shared teaching with him, and Ben came to faith. He gave his life to Jesus Christ in one of the boys' brigade meetings. Prayed with them, prayed the sinner's prayer, came to faith. Ten years later, bumped into Ben recently, and he says, oh, Stephen, got something to show you. He rolls up his sleeve, and he's got a tattoo of the boys' brigade badge. I said, Ben, out of all the tattoos you could have got, the boys' brigade badge, really? And he says, yes, really, because... 
It's the first place I ever fitted in, and it's where I met Jesus. It's a part of my life. It's part of my story. It's right there. So Ben found Jesus in the boys' brigade because he made a way for him. And every time there was a, a camp or something that his family came from their office part of town, his family couldn't afford, we always made a way for him. We made sure that Ben was not rejected because of his poverty or his medical conditions or anything, and he came to faith. Now, Ben became an evangelist, the most unlikely character that you would look at and say, really? You became an evangelist. So the next story is Ben introducing me to his friends. Now, sometimes when you're evangelizing, you get taken out of your comfort zone. I don't know if you've ever heard of the hip-hop hug. It's also called the dap, the pound hug, the bro hug, the dude hug, the homie hug, the bro grab, the one-armed hug, the bro handshake, the man hug, or the handshake hug. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm going to demonstrate it. Chris is primed to demonstrate this. So it's not a normal handshake. So let's do this side on, Chris. Side on so people can see it. So it's not the normal handshake. That's, aha, touche. It's the Handshake up here, and you pull each other in and do this. You bash your shoulders together. Let's do it in normal speed and in super slow motion. <laughs> Thank you for that excellent demonstration of the hip hop hug. Now, Ben told his friends everything that he heard at the Boys Brigade. Ben came from the roughest part of town, a lot of guys there that he hung out with. Their lives were pretty messy, pretty uh, broken up. Um, but I went down to the co-op in Up Hall one day, and Ben, across the other side of the road, shouting, Hi, Stephen, hi, hi. And then his pals are shouting, Hi, hi, I never met them before. Hi, you, you, I want a word with you. <laughs> What's going on? These guys came across an outside co-op in Up Hall. Never met these guys before, but they came up and gave me a hip-hop hug. They're grabbing me and pulling me in, banging the shoulders. And what's going on here? And then it's twin brothers. Another guy did it, pulling me in. I thought, what's going on here? And I'd watched them. They'd been outside the chip eating their chips. So they just threw their chips in the bin and the grease and everything. <laughs> Whoa, hey. Ben says, this is my pals. And introduced it. And the, this pal said, we've heard everything that you've been telling Ben. Did, did your grandmother really get healed when she was in a coma? I said, wow, I told Ben that a year ago. Wow. Did, did you really build the, the house of the year in Scotland? Wow, I told Ben that about six months ago. Yeah, I did that. Well, you've really prayed with someone that was sick and that became well? Yeah, I told Ben that last month. Aye. Explain that, bro. Explain it. And so I'm telling them, you know, you're praying. God does it. Now you do it me. You pray and God comes down. His power comes down. He'll say, oh, bro, when they come and give you the hip hop hug. Bang, they're in there with the hand, bang on the shoulder. Every time you said something that you liked, they liked, it's, oh, bro. And then the, the, it's in there with a the hip-hop hug. Mere grease, mere grease. Brun sauce. <laughs> Fish supper, my goodness. And this went on for weeks. Every time I went down to the co-op, these guys are across the other side of the road. Hey, Stephen, what a word with you. Uh, one time I thought... The people beside me thought, I wonder if I need to phone the police, because they shouted, hey, we've been looking for you. We need to see you right now. And they're shouting, and I'm standing there, and these guys, people are watching what's going on here, and these guys came up and started hip-hop hug, you know. But one time, hip-hop hug, these guys come up, and they said, Ben told us that he gave his life to God. Can we do that? So I talked them through the theology of it all, Outside the court, every time they like something, God really loves me. Oh, bro, <laughs> hey, they're in there. God loves me, brilliant. God died for me, whoa. And I led them through the sinner's prayer outside the front door of co-op in my hometown in Up Hall. Outside my comfort zone, people watching, brown sauce on their hands. But God turned up. He is an omnipresent anytime, anywhere, able to do abundantly more than we can ask or think. God and we have to be ready for him. So I work in psychology as well, and Heather mentioned that I go into schools, or used to before COVID, uh, and I was in one primary school, and my job was to go and work with kids who were struggling to access their education and get them ready to learn, fill them with confidence and motivation. 
I did that and did it for years. And one day, a head teacher in a school came to me and said, I know this is not your job, but there's a mother in the school. She lost her husband. He died. And she's struggling with her boy. And she keeps coming to us for help. And, and there's only so much we can do. But I really know that you're so good with the kids. I just know that you could help this woman. Would you be willing to speak with her? So you, I know it's not your job, and I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, absolutely. She's in my office right now. Okay, I'll go and speak with her. Because God talks about looking out for the widows and the orphans. The boy wasn't an orphan, but I went and spoke with the woman. And as I was chatting to her, and she's in tears, and she's talking about how, how tough life has been without her husband. As she's speaking, the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, tell her to take her son to a church. I thought, I can't say that. I can't say that. I could get sacked. Not to bring my faith into this. Uh, this might bring the school into disrepute. I don't know how she's going to react. She may be offended that I'm talking about God, but kept on coming. Tell this woman to take her son to a church. So, right, oh, how am I going to say this without offending? I'll talk a bit more experience. You know, I grew up in the church, and I found it great. And there were so many people who helped me to grow up. There were great people in the church, and they were like mentors. And there were help to, to my mom when my dad worked in Saudi Arabia for seven years. And uh, we had a lot of help from the church. And you know the, the, the phrase that it takes a village to raise a child? Maybe, just maybe, it would be a good thing for you to take your son to a church. First thing that she said, what church should I go to? So I mentioned a church that I could recommend. And uh, when I went home that day, I phoned the pastor of the church, spoke to this woman, maybe she'll come to your church on Sunday. He phones on Sunday night. The woman came to the church today. We gave her a VIP welcome, her and her son. Her son loved the, the kids' church. I preached the gospel. I gave an altar call. And the first person down the front, giving their heart to Jesus, was this woman. Now, I didn't lead her to, to the Lord, but I played my part because I was ready in the midst of my workplace, to go out of my comfort zone, wasn't prepared to be working with adults, but with kids that day, but I did it. Okay. Takes us on to the great, great work of the food bank. I got involved with the food bank five years ago. Um, the food bank was struggling financially at the time, almost closed their doors. They were looking for someone to come in with some, some uh, business news to, to help them to develop, to, to get a sure foot and get finances coming in. And what happened after that, when I went in just one day a week, it was miraculous. We, we prayed about how we take the organization forward. We felt it was important to change the, the aim of the organization, not just to end hunger in West Lothian, but to end poverty and hunger in West Lothian. Then it was like the storehouse of heaven opened up. Now, God's got previous on food banks. Look in scripture. God loves a food bank. The whole of Israel, two million people out in the desert for 40 years, they got manna and quails. First ever food bank in my book. And then Jesus fed the 5,000. Food's important. And God opened up, and we went from this 100,000 pound organization to a 1.2 million pound organization. We fed thousands upon thousands of people. We started the food network during COVID, led the food network, 47 organizations working together. We, we provided 4.3 million meals for people during COVID that were struggling financially. We saved 140 tons of food from going to waste. A whole lot of things happened. Amazing stuff. But one day in, in the midst of all of that, we said a prayer. We prayed, Father, this is great that we're feeding the hungry, but I think you've called us to more. I think you've called us to help bring people back to you. Would you send an evangelist? I mean, Heather's going to be preaching in a couple of weeks' time um, about saying that 72 and how we should pray to the Lord of the harvest to send harvesters. So we prayed for a harvester. Lord, could you send someone? We need a, we need a, a delivery driver just now. Could you send someone who's an evangelist and they could use the situations to bring people back to you that very day? Unbelievable. I, 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 I laugh when I say that very day because it happened that very day. Someone who was part-time pastoring a church said, I need a job. Could I be your delivery driver? I think God wants me to share the gospel with people as I deliver to their houses. Brilliant. 
And so he started the next day, and the first delivery he made walking down this woman's path at our house with the groceries was someone that he knew from years and years ago who was a Christian but backslid and totally ran away from God. And this woman came out of her house, broke down in tears, and said, I don't know how I got to this position. Will you bring me back to God? The first person that he met with the delivery. God is an omnipresent anytime, anywhere, able to do abundantly more than we can ask or think God. Also in the food bank, I talked last week about vision and provision. We had, as we moved into this building two years ago now, yes, two years ago now, beside the ground and the building was all this waste ground and it was a real problem when it rained, it flooded and water came into the warehouse. And I remember one day standing at that entrance to the warehouse that's up there in the top right, praying, Lord, why have you brought us here? This place is horrible. How are we going to fix this water coming into the building? And the, the, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, look up. This is going to be a beautiful place. You will grow food here. And I looked up and I could see a vision. I looked at the, the ground. I could see polytunnels. I could see raised beds. And I could see something that looked like the Eden Project dome. I could see it all. It was in front of me. God gave me a vision of what this horrible ground could look like. And that day, I prayed, Lord, if this is your vision, give us provision. And that day, it was two hours later, that day, someone from the council phoned me to say, we've just received a whole lot of money from the Scottish government for place-based investment to turn derelict ground into community benefit. We've only got a short time to get this money out. We're going to fast track this. Does the food bank have any projects that they've been thinking about that could benefit from this money? I said, yes, Martin, we'll be thinking a long time about... <laughs> Building a garden that grows food and people can come and volunteer, that's a brilliant idea. Within two months, we had 198,000 pounds given to us to go and do this, and we did it. And it's brilliant, and it's been a great place to give testimony. We've had volunteers came in, corporate groups have came in, and I've been able to tell them about prayers answered because they've always asked me, how did you do this? This is amazing. This is fantastic. We've got 357 raised beds that I saw, the three polytunnels. We've got the hypodome, as you see in the bottom left there. It looks like the Eden Project dome. Absolutely amazing. And they said, how did this all come about? This is beautiful. Never seen anything like it. And I've always said to them, do you want the real answer? They said, yeah. I said, well, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm a man of faith. And we prayed, and this happened. So I've been able to share that with people. We even prayed in the process about getting a gardener to come in with the expertise to make the garden work. And the same day, <laughs> the same day a guy turned up that was trained at the Royal Botanics, tri trained at Oak Ridge Agricultural College, turned up, he'd started a landscaping business, turned up at our food bank. He says, I'm here to cut your grass for free because I like what you guys do. A three hour conversation later, Colin was appointed our head gardener and he's been amazing, produced six tons of food last year whilst we're building it. Incredible, it's got the potential to do 10 tons. God is able to do abundantly more than we can ask or think. And he's given us a platform to testify and share his gospel. Last one, we're affiliated to the Trussell Trust. If you ever think, what's the point of, of, of trying to make a difference? It's too big a problem. There was a Christian family in Salisbury in 1997 prayed, Lord, what do you want us to do? We see people in need in our community. What do you want us to do? And they very clearly were led to provide three days of food for people who were entitled to get benefits but had a three-day wait until they got the benefits. So someone fleeing, for example, domestic violence, uh, they have to set up a new life. They're entitled to get support from the government but had a three-day wait. And they said, we'll fill the gap with God's provision, we will fill that gap. By the way, it's five weeks now. That's the five-week wait. If someone's fleeing from their life and they're entitled to support from the government because they've got nothing, they've got to wait five weeks to get their food, uh, get their money. How, how do they feed their kids? So that's what we do. We, we plug that gap for five weeks. But they prayed and said, what do you want us to do about this? And they felt led to, to start this. And it became the Trussell Trust, which is now the biggest family of food banks across the UK, 1,300 food banks 
And supermarkets have donated millions of pounds to the work that they do in God's name. Incredible. And in last year, the most talked about charity in the UK, there's 20,000 charities in the UK, uh, the most talked about charity in the, in the media, because there's media watchdogs that, that come out with all the statistics, the most talked about charity in 2022 was the Trussell Trust, started by an answer to prayer. So what we're going to do with all this that I've just shared this morning, what I'd like to say is I would love you to go and reflect. What is the message that you're putting out to the world in your own life? What is the message that we as a church are putting out to the world? What is God calling us to do? If God turned up today and read from the scriptures, would we reject him? Because it doesn't fit with our agenda. Last slide. Went to the Trussell Trust Conference just last month, and it was interesting that so many people who lead the feed, lead food banks in the UK, they are pastors of churches and leaders of churches, and we got together in a room, and we explored one question. What does a church that addresses social injustice look like? I was fascinated by the answers. I was all in. I wanted to hear this, so I wrote them all down. This is what the leaders of the churches across Scotland who are involved in food banks said, that a church who addresses social injustice is relational. You can relate to people. That we are fully active in community events and life fully active in the community. The church building is used by the community seven days a week. It's not just ours on a Sunday. Seven day a week building. We listen to the community. As Andy Clark, as I've heard him say a few times, we shouldn't be turning up to do stuff to the community. We need to listen to the community and meet their needs. Ben needed to fit in. He needed a place to fit in. We gave him that boys brigade. And through that, that qualified us to share the gospel with him. Campaigns for social justice widely, missed one. Listens to experts by lived experience in the community. We, we're not experts in poverty unless we've lived it. So we need to listen to people who are got the actual needs. We campaign for social justice. We actively provide social justice. We pursue opportunities to serve the community. We're always ready to serve. We provide practical help to people in need. We're always ready to share the good news of the gospel. We walk the walk of faith, not just talk the talk. We make a difference positively. Sometimes churches make a difference negatively. In my work as a psychologist, I've worked with a lot of Christians where the church made the difference to them, but not in a positive way. And the last one I've kind of put out on its own because I love what this says, that the church that addresses social injustice is a community of believers freely giving of their time, their talents, and their treasure to serve people in love and advance the kingdom of God. That's the kind of church that I'm on board with. That's the kind of church as an individual I want to be. Maybe that's not everybody's cup of tea, but I love that. Let's pray. Father, we are so in awe of you. We love you, we worship you, we marvel at the incredible things that you do. Father, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would anoint us this day to share good news with the poor, to give sight back to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and that you would use us as a church, as St. John's, as individuals, to declare your favor and amongst the people of Linlithgow and their surrounding environs. Lord, we give all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor to you, for you are so worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen.